Douglas Baird is uh, Professor at the University of, of, of Liverpool, um, has uh, been uh, uh, working on the Neolithic in the Konya region for a very long time now, and uh, the focus of his work has been the excavation at Bodja Clotepe, which is what we're about to, to hear about. We're, we're in the same um, we're in the same region as Chatahuyuk, but I think probably we should say we're not necessarily in the same environment as Chatahuyuk, because there was a lot of change between Ponjuklu, which at least I have always understood as a sort of predecessor to the more famous site, and, uh, and um, uh, so without more ado, um, the Neolithic of Central Anatolia and the antecedents of Chatahuyuk. Thanks Stephen, and I should say thanks to Stephen again because as you notice um, the British Institute at Ankara um, is the bedrock of our sponsorship I should say and, and that's important when you're digging on a site that doesn't actually have any bedrock even metaphorical bedrock is something to, to cling to um, so I'd like to thank Stephen and the, and the British Institute for their, for their continuing um, support as the, as the major sponsor in effect. But obviously it's a joint effort, as you can see, there are a number of universities <coughs> and a range of funding bodies. Um, today I'm going to focus specifically on the archaeology. Um, we do have a little visitor centre and experimental buildings and, and garden and interactive area. If you're interested in that aspect of archaeological work in Turkey, I'm happy to answer questions about that later, but at a modest time, so I'll focus on the archaeology uh, as Stephen mentioned, the antecedents of Chapel Huyuk, but particularly um, looking at the development of sedentary and farming uh, communities in this part of Anatolia, uh, Lee having talked about it in the southeast. Fortunately, Ian has, uh, in a way, introduced the, the Konya Plain here in, in south central Anatolia, um, where we see farming arriving really a little bit after the earliest evidence in the, the classic fertile present area. And, and the questions we started with when we started on the project were very much um, how, why, when, and, and who might have introduced uh, farming into this area. And I'll certainly address those briefly in the first part of the talk. But in particular, we were, apart from, you know, we wanted to go beyond some of these initial and mechanistic questions, if you like, to think a little bit about what it meant for foragers, foraging communities, caught up in this process of the development of, of sedentism in farming. So I want to unpack a little bit of some of these concepts and think about this as well at the household and individual um, level too, which we'll look at um, in the latter part of the, of the talk. So this is a bit about unpacking some of these large-scale phenomena that we talk about as the appearance of, of sedentism and the appearance of um, farming um, communities. In particular, concepts like sedentism, um, taken to be you know, the long-term occupation of a settlement locale, tend to be thought of, I think, still in rather monolithic ways. Year-round occupation over a number of years is a, is a classic definition, but I think we need a, a more nuanced approach um, in that way. Um, and also, you know, people still struggle with questions about whether the switch to uh, farming and herding was a, a rapid um, and dramatic process or a much slower and, and incremental one. So we'll look, at that. we'll look at those issues in the light of the evidence relating to households and individuals as well as at a, a broader scale. Uh, I'm going to talk in particular um, about the site of, of Bunjuklu, located only nine and a half kilometres north of Chakaluyuk. So you've heard about Chakaluyuk, obviously, but I will briefly mention this. This other site of Punarbasha, about 31 <coughs> kilometres southeast um, of Bunjuklu as well, because it's um, um, offered important evidence um, as to um, developments in the Konya Plain in this period. Um, uh, as well. And I do notice that in the program I appear to be bared of Punabrasha, um, so it's appropriate that we need to uh, talk about that. The chronological uh, framework we're thinking about um, is essentially the 10th and 9th millennium BC. Um, here's some radiocarbon that's modelled um, sets of radiocarbon dates really showed us there's individual plots here. These are some of the Bunjuklu dates for certain episodes in the um, 
stratigraphy of the of the settlement dating between about 8,300 and 7,600 BC. Pelabasha has a longer occupation. It actually starts in the late Pleistocene in the Epipaleolithic, um, but then is reoccupied at the beginning of the Holocene. Actually, back here about 9,600 BC. There's a date that isn't on here that that falls in in that area, and then seems to be regularly occupied um, until probably about 7,800. BC. So it overlaps with Bonjour Creek. So we've actually got two <coughs> settlements in the Konya Plain that are broadly contemporary. But I show you this as well because it immediately starts to help us address this question of, of sedentism. And it is interesting that both of these settlements then are occupied for very long periods of time, between 1700 and, and 2000 years. So in one sense, they're, they show very long term commitment to settlement locales. Um, one actually longer than the other, Punabasha longer. Is it more sedentary then? That's an interesting question. But we'll explore it in, through other axes, as it were, of thinking about stability um, in occupation and intensity of occupation. I've tried to sort of unpack a little bit, as I said I would, some of the ways that we might think about, about sedentism. I showed you the long term, if you like, uh, stretching over millennia. But that isn't only part of the way that we should think about sedentism, we should also think about periodicity and continuity, intensity of occupation over these long time periods. You know, do we have perhaps seasonal occupation over millennia at a particular site? People constantly returning, that's perhaps one type of sedentary behaviour as opposed to very intense occupation over shorter periods. And we'll come back to that when we look at the um, specific evidence. But we can start to address it by looking at some of the evidence of seasonality of occupation of these two sites. And that's important <coughs> for getting a sense of how the sites were occupied, but also their relationships, the relationships between Panabasha and Bunjuklu. Bunjuklu evidence is at the bottom. These are different seasonal indicators from plants and animals, Panabasha at the top. The dark bands show where we've got very strong evidence for those particular months and phases of seasons at the site. The greyer bands show other evidence that might extend more, more broadly in time. And I think you can see at Bunjuklu, we've certainly got evidence that suggests most of the year or year-round occupation at the site through, through the sequence. Interestingly, at Punabasha, there's a lot of overlap, so it looks like Punabasha is being occupied, remember, broadly chronologically at the same time, but seasonally at least through quite a, a part of the year at the same time as Bunjuklu. So they do seem to be distinct um, settlements occupied at the same time um, in the in the Konya Plain, but perhaps Punabasha isn't necessarily occupied so intensively through the whole year. Um, so there's perhaps, even though both of these communities might accord the label sedentary, some interesting evidence of variability and intensity um, of occupation. So that's us starting to unpack the sedentism question for these two communities in brief. What about the evidence of farming and herding that I mentioned as part of what uh, drew us to look at um, the development of these sorts of communities in the Konya Plain? Obviously, uh, Chapel Hook had been excavated quite a lot before we started, but the preceding developments were not well documented, especially in terms of the beginnings of farming and, and herding and sedentism on, on the plain. What we found, I think, shows unequivocally that at Bonjuklu we have the presence of domesticated plants. So after 8300 BC on the Konya Plain, we see the emergence of Bonjuklu as so far the earliest documented farming community in the equivalent of the early PPMB, as, um, as Lee would talk about it, contemporary with some of those big structures um, at, at um, Gobekli. Uh, this diagram just shows that it's not just that domestic seeds of the grains themselves are, are present, but also lots of weeds of cultivation that represent the growing of the plants in the local environment, almost certainly. Interestingly, we can compare that with earlier and contemporary Punabasha, where you see a complete absence um, of these plants. So we have two contemporary communities, although albeit Punabasha started earlier, one that seems to have adopted farming 30 kilometres away, they're not doing farming. The uptake of farming, like sedentism, is clearly a variable and nuanced process with different communities making different choices in, in this regard. 
Because Panabasha predates Bunjukli, the other thing that it tells us is, it seems, because there aren't even the wild ancestors of these domestic plants in the environment being exploited at Panabasha, in the Epipaleolithic or in the early Holocene, this strongly suggests to us, perhaps not surprisingly, in the middle of the Konya Plain, that these plants are introduced from probably areas to the south and east. So we have the spread of farming through the introduction of alien, shall we call them, domesticates, in terms of plants from outside the plain. <coughs> that hints at, the, at either the local forager adoption of farming or the arrival of colonising farmers. But we're able to answer that question, as I'll show you in a minute. Even though at Punabasha they're not interested, it would appear, in um, the adoption of cultivated or domesticated cereals or legumes. That doesn't mean they're not interested in plants because we've got lots of evidence from plant uh, consumption, uh, from the archaeobotanical evidence, uh, some of the carbonised plant remains here, uh, and indeed from the isotopes as well, the carbon and nitrogen isotopes um, from the human remains. What they're interested um, at Punabasha is in exploiting the local wild almond and terebinth uh, nuts and fruits and hackberry in the hills around. They're a rather nutty bunch, as I like to think of them, um, at, at Punabasha. So rather different life ways, and maybe the success of that nut economy, if you like, at, at Punabasha is one of the things that led that community to, as it appears, reject um, farming. We can find, we, we learn other evidence as well for, about the archaeobotanical record at Bunjukli that tells us a bit about whether this was a dramatic change to farming for the Bunjukli community. You can see the ubiquity and frequency um, of cereals and legumes represented at the series of different sites we're talking about here, including Chakalhuyuk a little bit later, obviously, Janasan 3, just immediately after the occupation of Bunjukli and, and Punabasha. And you can clearly see that um, the cereals and legumes are actually a very modest presence at the site of Bunjuklu compared to these later Neolithic uh, sites. So it doesn't seem that farming arrives with a big bang at Bunjuklu. It's slowly um, introduced a modest part of the activity and diet of these communities. And it's not just the carbonised seeds that suggest that, but the phytolith evidence as well. Most of the site of, is made up of reed phytoliths. Uh, and there's just a very small representation of, for example, uh, wheat phytoliths. If you look across a range of contexts, ubiquity, and in terms of actual raw frequency as well. So it's not a question of different processing practices at Bonjuklu uh, or the like, these differences with Janusan 3 and Chagabuyuk. It's actually because um, cereal and legume growing and consumption is modest at Bonjuklu, it would appear. So it's not necessarily a dramatic shift. We'll talk in a minute about why this community might have adopted farming then, but let's turn to the animal um, evidence and record uh, before, before we do that. Um, this is a, a diagram showing proportions of uh, different animal species at Punabasha, at Bonjuklu, and some of the uh, contemporary and, and subsequent sites. You can see immediately uh, the blue is uh, boss, wild cattle, morphologically these are wild cattle at Bunjuklu. The both Punabasha and Bunjuklu are focused on, on wild uh, aurochs hunting. Interestingly, Bunjuklu as well um, seems to be focused on the uh, hunting and consumption of morphologically wild pig, boar uh, as well. Much less important, intriguingly, at, at, at Punabasha. At Bunjuklu, caprine, sheep and goat are very, very infrequent in major contrast to Chakabuyuk with its domestic caprines. So at least, you know, if we understand caprines to be the earliest um, herded of domestic animals, uh, and so we'll talk a bit more about that in, in, in a minute, uh, it doesn't look as if domestic animals or herded animals are particularly important at Bunjuklu, and not even at Punabasha, where morphologically uh, the caprines there, the sheep and goat, are, are wild as well. But if we take a closer look, we have some rather um, intriguing evidence. I should say that I've just shown you the, the larger mammals there, but the other notable thing about both Punabash and Bunjuklu, but particularly Bunjuklu, is a really strong focus on aquatic resources. Lots of fish, lots of water birds um, as well. So that this is really a forager community, very focused on wetland exploitation, where the aurochs and boar and uh, fish and uh, water birds would have been present. And our recent excavation of human 
uh, mid and latrine areas with human coprolites full of frog bone uh, emphasise the consumption of another aquatic resource as well. So these are foragers who are adding a small amount of uh, plant uh, cultivation to um, their subsistence practices, if you like. But I did mention these caprines, which by the time of Chatelier, a few hundred years later, are certainly domestic. And there's interesting hints that maybe at Bonjukli, they're starting to manipulate local caprines, bringing down from the hills. This evidence comes from evidence of caprine diet, carbon and nitrogen isotope, um, uh, evidence of, of sheep and goat uh, diet. Uh, Caroline Middleton for a PhD at Liverpool um, documented uh, th this evidence showing that the Epipaleolithic and early Holocene caprines from Punabasha have relatively low nitrogen um, in their diets relating to the plants that they're eating. The, the later caprines from Chakalhuyukan and the 7th millennium at Punabasha have higher nitrogen. Interestingly, there are about 50% of the sample analysed at, at Bonjuklu um, of the caprines, the very small number of caprines at the site, do show elevated nitrogen. Like slightly later, Janusan 3 as well. And we now have recent, recent ancient DNA evidence that suggests <coughs> these caprines at, at Janusan 3 are indeed um, domestic animals as well. So it seems quite likely that this impact on caprine diets that we see so notably at, at Janusan 3 is starting in a small way at Bunjuklu. And there may be, just like they're engaging in, in low-level food production with, with uh, crops, they're doing the same with, with animal uh, manipulation. And this is further, further indicated by the presence of herbivore dung in the hearths at Bunjuklu. They're burning herbivore dung, likely caprine. Uh, dung that suggests they're keeping these animals uh, close to the site. And given that they must have been consuming caprine meat in small proportions, maybe this gives us a clue as to why they're starting to uh, manipulate uh, caprines. It could be as much for things like dung and milk as it was for meat, uh, for example. So we're looking at, at communities of low-level food production, introducing farming to the Konya Plain, as I said, through adoption from areas to the south and east, uh, or through colonisation. Uh, which is it? Well, we can answer that question through a number of lines of evidence. The who uh, question. Um, the, the bulk of the lithic assemblage at the site are these obsidian microliths, these really small tools. And these are just like the microliths of the slightly earlier communities at Punabasha, who obviously aren't uh, cultivating plants, and epipaleolithic communities in the area. So there's a lot of evidence of continuity here. This is a, a group of wetland foragers, uh, in effect, who've lived in this area for significant periods and are well adapted to it, who were introducing farming from other areas, we would argue, on the lithic evidence. And this is supported by some recent ancient DNA evidence, where we've analysed Punabasha epipaleolithic humans and there's evidence of 90% genetic continuity between the epipaleolithic genomes that have been analysed and the Bunjuklu ancient DNA uh, that we have. So genetic and um, material culture continuity seem very clear on the Konya plane, pointing to the introduction of farming um, by already present forager communities. By what mechanism did they get hold of these plants um, that they're introducing? Well, I think we've got good evidence of that as well, because we've actually got lots of evidence going right back to the Epipaleolithic at Punabasha. We've got human burials from the Epipaleolithic at 14,000 BC Cal, for example, that's already showing this evidence. And we see it in early Punabasha as well. We've got evidence of lots of marine shells um, making up beads, necklaces and the like at the site. Most of the chipstone tools are obsidian from 150 kilometres away to the east. There's an introduction of new technologies like ground stone axes from areas to the south and east and shared ritual practices like skull removal. Note the absence of a skull in this human burial at Epipaleolithic Punabasha. Ideas and goods are moving around between central Anatolia and areas to the south and east. And presumably with them come some of these uh, domestic... <coughs> Uh, plants that appear in the Konya Plain by about 8,300 BC 
at Bonjour Club. Exchange networks link central Anatolia very tightly with areas to the south and east over a long period preceding the occupation of Bonjour Club. So that's the, the big picture story, if you like, about um, Semitism, cultivation and herding, which I will return to briefly at, at the end. But what about the forager community itself in terms of the households and individuals that made it up that were part of this, this process, if you like? Well, we can look at a little bit closer at that now, um, I think, and, and learn very interesting things about the nature of, of the communities caught up in these, in these longer term processes. There are a number of interesting features, and this is where many of these show you know, direct antecedents to some of the practices we see at Chapel Hill a few, a few hundred years later. The first point I want to um, emphasise is the um, degree of continuities in the way that the site is occupied, part of that Semitism story in a way that I flagged earlier. We find that buildings, houses are continually reconstructed on the same location. This is a set of four buildings out of a sequence of six in one area that are continually rebuilt in the, in the same location, a sort of practice that's well known from Chapel Hill, for example. So household, this isn't just a convenience of um, rebuilding in the same location, because it wouldn't have actually provided the most stable foundations. Lots of, unlike Chapel Hill, there's lots of open space at Bonjuklu. People could have moved their houses pretty much anywhere in the, in the settlement area. This is a deliberate symbolic statement of continuity of the continuity of the household, um, I would, would argue. And because people are buried under their houses, this is a burial pit here, I would suggest it's also a deliberate desire to live over the ancestors as well. Connections with ancestors are important here, and we'll talk a bit more about that at the moment. Something that, that Ian alluded to is potentially <coughs> very important in structuring these early Neolithic communities. So continuity is very important, uh, and the symbolic statement of continuity as well. There's other interesting evidence of continuities in practice too, that we see um, in all of the buildings we understand to be residential structures at Bonjukli. There, uh, the domestic floor space is divided into to two segments in all, in all of those buildings. There's a sort of sunken, kitchen area in the northwest of the buildings that we, we call the dirty area and in the southeast there's the clean area um, analogous to the divisions of space that we see in the Chapel Hill buildings I would suggest a direct um, predecessor practice um, and this is not just something that's built into the structures from the beginning uh, but it's something that's created by repetitive practice through the intensity of use of these structures um, the, the, the floor plasters are thicker and cleaner um, in the um, southeastern parts of, of the buildings. And these buildings are regularly re-plastered. Uh, we have up to 25 re-plasterings. This is what interesting contrast with Punabasha where there's a maximum of seven um, in, the, in the buildings there. The half is constantly raked out and patches of floor and organic debris accumulate in the, in the kitchen area. So construction and daily and monthly practices are different within these structures to divide these different areas. The southeastern area, the clean area if you like, is the, also the area where we see evidence for ritual and symbolism. This is where the burials take place within the building and this is where we find painted floors and animal heads built into the walls. I'll talk a bit more about that in, in the moment. So these are strong structured differentiations in the use of the structures. I think there's lots of interesting suggestions that perhaps people felt their houses were very analogous to people as well. The houses were as much a part of the household as the people that made up the, the households. This differentiation in the use of space is very interesting. Most communities, uh, many societies have you know, an understanding of the human body that divides it up into clean and dirty zones. I think that houses are being thought of um, in that way. Like people's bodies, and we know this from the, the burials, the houses are sometimes decorated. Bodies are sometimes covered with red ochre. That seems clear from our, from our burials. And like people, houses had significant moments in their lives marked by ritual rites of passage, if you like. So I think there's a strong symbolic connection seen in the continuity of the house 
but also in these other aspects between the household and the house. Some of the other indicators are, uh, uh, it seems to me, striking. So like some of the human bodies we have are disarticulated and the heads are removed. And that happens to the houses at the a certain phases in their life or at the ends of their lives. The, the head of the house, the roof is removed. The, the um, roof beams are undoubtedly um, uh, reused. But the limbs of the house, the posts are removed as well. And this is associated with ritual practice. So, for example, figurines and obsidian cores and tools are deposited in the host post holes after the posts are, are removed. They're marked with ritual. This nice little figurine of a, a bear lady. Um, when I say bear lady, don't get too excited. I mean, well, actually, she probably is bear, but um, she is a bear, B-E-A-R, as well as apparently a human uh, female. Um, so ritual practice connected with the, the disassembling of the house. And we've talked about some of the symbolism as well. And one of the interesting things about all of this ritual and symbolism um, at Bunjuklu is uh, just how distinctive and unique it seems to be from house to house. Each house, presumably each household, had a distinctive identity marked by the variability in this symbolism. No two houses have really the same symbolic apparatus. Here we see some different examples. A building with a a double bucranium here are the two oryx skulls in the wall of this house, building four. In another building, and um, you see a, 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 a boar jaw inserted into a niche in, in, in the wall. Uh, buildings have different parts of their floors painted, um, for example, different sorts of special deposits within, within the building. So this symbolism is part of, of stressing household identity distinctive household identities as well, as part of this strong connection between house um, and household. How long did these uh, buildings, buildings last? Um, well, we're actually, uh, and how frequent was this ritual practice and symbolic practice? That's quite interesting in thinking of the intensity of these, of these practices. Um, Bayesian analysis of our C14 dates allows us to pin down that sequence of six buildings in Area K pretty precisely. Uh, the one I, I showed you in the pictures of um, somewhat earlier. Actually, the C14 dates with Bayesian analysis all fall pretty much in the 83rd um, century BC, between 60 and 120 years of occupation for six houses. Um, the plaster floors across these six houses amount to 75 plaster floors. So just as ethno-historically people plastered their houses each year, I think that's pretty much something that's happening at Bunjilklu as well. And that's quite neat because it gives us a very precise calendar for the occupation of these houses and suggests these number of floors accord approximately to the lifespans of the houses. And you can see they're moderately short, uh, some of them very short, some of them um, a bit longer. These numbers show the frequency, the floors that have, the frequency of floors with burials or painting or some sort of evidence of symbolic practice. And you can see that these were not common events in the lives of the houses. These are sporadic, probably um, you know, high, low frequency, high intensity ritual practices as Harvey Whitehouse um, would have it in the life of these communities. But this sense of temporality and the intensity of occupation can be used in another way as well. It tells us something about uh, the frequency of burial and the number of people <coughs> buried in these houses against their, their lifespan. And while some buildings seem to have enough people buried in them, most of the buildings don't seem to have quite enough, quite enough burials in. So a lot of people are buried under their houses, but maybe not all of each household was buried um, under the house. But we can unpick this a, a little bit more um, through other evidence as well, evidence of ancient uh, DNA from these human remains. How long have I got left, Stephen? We've got mm, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, right, well, we're, we're on schedule then. Uh, so I can explore this um, a, a little bit in terms of what this ancient DNA evidence is now telling us about the nature of these households and the people caught up in it and their relationships. For a start, it certainly suggests that you know, some of the people buried under house floors are directly um, related. The, the red lines connect sets of burials in a couple of houses um, in reference to their first degree 
genetic relationships. These are people that are either siblings or parents and children. So they are directly related. You've actually got two buildings here. The plan shows you building 14, which uh, seems to immediately succeed this earlier building that the photograph shows you, building 12, <coughs> uh, which is slightly to its south, but chopped into um, by building uh, 14. So let's unpick the history of um, these households and look at these relationships to understand the households I've been talking about in terms of their symbolic practices and in terms of human relationships. First of all, uh, let's start at the end of the life of the structure. These two burials, both adults, are placed in at the end of the life of the structure. Stratigraphically, of, of this building, building 14, so we're, going, we're starting at the latest and going through to the earliest, these two individuals have a parent-child relationship. That's what the ancient DNA can tell us. But what is that relationship? Well, this is where the archaeology can help. Because this male, who died probably around 40 years, we can talk more about the osteoarchaeological evidence that helps us with that, give or take five, um, was buried uh, at the end of the life of the structure, two floors uh, after this lady. So maybe two to four years after this lady. Uh, this lady was older than him. She's probably of the age of 55 or so, certainly over 50. So she must have been born before him, um, almost certainly. She's older than him and she was buried uh, before him. And she's quite, you know, significantly older than him. So almost <coughs> certainly this is the mother and this is the son in this relationship. So here we have you know, a mother-son connected directly to this household, perhaps living in it for some of the time, potentially. Obviously, these are people who are buried together. Does that mean they live together in the house? That's much trickier to get at, of course. But they are connected, and they're connected to the house. So, obviously, ancestors are buried under the house floors. Let's go back a little bit earlier in time in the history of this house. This uh, mid-aged female... Uh, was buried after the first floor of the house, so probably about 20, 15 to 20 years earlier than these two individuals, this adult was buried, not long after the house had been constructed, one or two years after the house had been constructed. She's interesting because she wasn't buried alone, she was buried with a neonate individual. The neonate is buried here. It was placed. She, we know from the ancient DNA, obviously we can't sex them from the bones, but the ancient DNA tells us this neonate was a female. She was buried with this adult female. This adult female is about 35, 40 years old. Could have been the mother, but that's quite old. That's quite interesting. Actually, we've got ancient DNA from both of these individuals, and that specifically tells us that this neonate is not genetically related to the adult female buried in that house. Indeed, that neonate is not genetically related to anyone whose ancient DNA we have from that house. So it seems quite likely that that neonate is indeed somehow buried in to the house. Perhaps there was an emotional connection between the lady buried there and the neonate or some other form of <coughs> relationship. But it does suggest that these households, as we see them in terms of burials, have you know, interesting sets of connections and that they're not necessarily purely, um, purely <coughs> sets of nuclear families, although maybe nuclear family relationships at their core. Because there is, of course, other uh, evidence we have here too. This adult female is not genetically related by first or second degree to these two adults buried in the building either. Obviously it could still be a nuclear household, not everyone is genetically closely related in a nuclear household, hopefully, at least not where I come from, I can't speak about where you come from of course, <laughs> but probably not. Um, but it does suggest that maybe there's quite complex constituencies of, of these households. And of course, there are missing people here. The father of this adult male uh, is not represented in this evidence at all. Perhaps he just survived the house, but that's quite interesting too. What about the connection with the earlier house? You can see that through this red line. This adult female buried shortly after the house was constructed is 
related in a first degree relationship with this adult male buried probably about 14 floors earlier in building 12. Uh, he died as a mid-adult around 35 to 40. Uh, she died in the same sort of time frame, age frame, maybe just slightly uh, younger, interestingly enough. They are brother and sister. They are brother and sister. So there are genetic continuities between these houses um, very clearly. But, um, you know, um, that's very interesting, I think. In terms of us teasing apart the history of these households, it's very useful. And we can go further as well, because of course we know from the osteoarchaeological evidence about the practices they engaged in. And we know about their diets from isotope evidence and um, also their mobility from strontium isotope evidence. So I can come back now to this question of did these people live in this house during the life of these houses? And we can start to unpack a bit more about you know, what the continuities and intensity of occupation of these houses mean in terms of this term sedentism that we use. Let's go to the, um, let's go to the isotope evidence, the strontium um, and carbon and nitrogen isotope evidence analysed by, by Pearson. The four individuals I've shown you are the four individuals at the bottom of the list here on this list of strontium <laughs> isotope values. Strontium is telling us about where in the landscape these people were born and spent their early years from largely the water that they ingested, particularly. The whole of the Bon, bon Clue set analysed, that's this group of people, um, seem to have come from this area in the, in the northern part of the Fang, uh, probably. So probably from Bon Clue itself or its immediate uh, surrounds. But interestingly, the four who were genetically connected in the way that I've shown you have the closest set of strontium isotope results, which is quite nice. They are probably local individuals. They were probably born in that area close by, um, as the genetic evidence might suggest. But we can find further insights by looking at the carbon and nitrogen evidence of diet. Do they all have <coughs> the same diet? Well, no. And very interestingly, that adult male I showed you who was buried at the end of the life of building 14, he's a bit of an outlier. He's here on this diagram of carbon and nitrogen isotopes. He's over here because he's consumed quite a lot of animals that had C4 plants in their diet, a particular set of plants that aren't very common on the, on the Conuplane. And as you can see, these are all the animals that the humans at Bon Duclu ate. There are very few animals that seem to have C4 in their diet actually present on the site at Bon Duclu. These two are actually a couple of small step birds that probably aren't a big part of the Bon Duclu inhabitant's diet. So everything would suggest that this adult male, the son of the older female who was buried before him in building 14, even though his strontium isotope showed he was probably born and brought up in that area of Bonjuklu, of Bonjuklu itself, sometime in the last 10 years of his life or so, he went somewhere quite far away from Bonjuklu and ate C4 eating animals and then came back to end up buried in the house with his mother at Bonjuklu. So we can see that mobility and residential stability are playing out in very different ways and interesting ways in relation to these groups that go to make up um, the houses and households of Bonjuclu. Even though it seems from the other bits of the archaeological record, obviously these households have a, a strong sense of identity and continuity um, in the symbolic dimension, at least. Time, Stephen. I think if you can finish up now, that would be about yeah. a minute or so. Okay. So just to very finish up very quickly though, there's another dimension to this um, as well, and that is that not all the burials we have at Bunjil Clu um, are under the houses. As I said, there's some missing dead from under the houses, and we seem to have found them, uh, the strontium isotopes suggest, um, in the open areas where we find fully articulated inhumations like under the houses, but also disarticulated remains <coughs> and human skulls. Now these are very interesting sets of people, especially the ones whose skulls are, are buried um, in the, in the midden areas, because their isotopes, carbon and nitrogen isotopes, even though the strontium isotopes are the same, mm -hmm. the carbon and nitrogen isotopes are a little bit different. These are people that seem to have eaten 
a slightly different set of foods, not dramatically different probably, but a different emphasis within the Bunjukri diet. They ate together probably fairly regularly over the last 10 years of their lives, and they were buried together in ways different from the people under the houses. Actually, they probably ate more of the animals <coughs> represented in this part of the diagram, and these are fish, aquatic birds, and probably also plants as well. So, whilst these households might be symbolically important and have a strong identity, obviously we've seen, and also people who've got close genetic relationships are buried together, people do come and go, and there are other principles structuring social relationships at Wonjukli, apart from simply households. And what people did in the landscape, and where they went, and who they went with, I think are probably as important as their membership um, of these small, tight-knit uh, households in structuring social relationships. Um, at Bunjukli. Um, and I think through these ways we can start to see a bit more nuanced fashion um, what the adoption of farming and herding and sedentary practices really meant for households um, and individuals um, in the Konya Plain between 9600 and 7500 BC. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Doug. Uh, one lesson that if I'm going to commit a murder in the rest of my life, I'll uh, make sure I keep your scientific team well away from any of the clues. They'll be on me in no time. Um, uh, Lee, I wonder if uh, it's, it's still here. Absolutely. Come up. Uh, we're, we're eating into our lunch break, but I think there's time for a, a few quick, quick questions to our two speakers. Now, could I just see hands from people who've got the questions? One here, two. Um, fine, let's, let's start here then. Thank you. Um, I both, really question for both of you, but particularly Douglas mentioned the large amount of wetland <coughs> species in the diet and the use of reeds and so on. How much is the environment around Bonjour and Tepe the same as it was in antiquity or different? Well, the person who should really answer that question is sitting just behind you, Neil Roberts. But I will start, and he can always say something. Um, it's pretty different. You know, I mean, now it's a very intensively cultivated, irrigated area. Uh, the water table, you know, as Neil told me, um, when we were first working together in the Conyer Plain, I know it's dropped, you know, by, at that point in 1995 or six, it had dropped like 30 metres in the past years it must have dropped way more than that. They drill wells now 100 metres and don't get water. So it's changed pretty dramatically and it was you know probably at its wettest both in terms of rainfall and surface water you know just before Bunjukli was occupied or around the time of Bunjukli and obviously it's very dry now relatively speaking although they still draw the irrigation water from you know the sources that ultimately the tourist mountains. So quite a big change and many complex and varied changes in the intervening period between as well. First year. Oh, thank you both, very interesting. My question is for Dr. Clare. Um, I wondered if you could say something more about this new understanding of how the enclosures were filled in. So they weren't ritually filled in, but they were buried by landslide, is that what you're saying? That's what we're saying, I mean, <coughs> the so situation. How, was, was all, were all the enclosures filled that way? Well, we have to speak for each building for itself. Obviously, it'd be wrong to sort of you know, jump to conclusions too early. But for, at least from the main excavation area, uh, building D, uh, building B, um, and C, I think we're seeing that uh, quite clearly. Um, obviously, it wasn't all... I mean, you have to differentiate. I mean, there are various events. It wasn't just one event, but it was a sequence of events over a course of time, which we can't actually pin down yet. So it means a sequence of different landscapes <coughs> different, or different slides, each different, enclosure at a different time? I think there were probably certain events which would have affected the same buildings. If they were the same, they would have been. So I, I, you know, I think we're, we might even be connecting these with things like earthquakes, that sort of thing. I mean, it could be something like that in this direction. Um, but not all of these would have been um, nat say natural. But um, you know, I think there were possibly times when uh, an attempt was made after a, a landslide event, 
to stabilise and the material was brought in or deposited there intentionally for that purpose. So I think we're seeing so various events. Yeah, so as I, said, I think we have to look at each building for itself and look more closely at those different events um, in the buildings, in the stratigraphy of the backfill. Or fill. Backfill is a wrong word as well, not the fill. Thank you. Question. One behind and then Colin after that. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, um, uh, two questions for uh, Doug Baird and one for uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> just, just short, um, we have to watch the time. Uh, the, the first one uh, actually relates to what the lady uh, said uh, uh, in the first row. Um, you um, have found that a lot of fish was eaten in Bonjaklu, mm -hmm. and this now uh, to Ian Harder actually, in uh, Chetanhoyo, to my understanding, fish was very rarely eaten, although uh, Landscape-wise, they are both in wetland surroundings. Um, how can that difference be explained if this difference is still um, valid and evident? Um, the second question to Doug uh, would be: You um, have very much emphasised the ritual, symbolic aspect, and also the difference in the house within the clean area, the um, dirty area, the dirty area with the hearth and the ash uh, rake out and so on. Am I just a uh, practical housewife thinking that um, there might be just very practical reasons for separating the dirty work area from the cleaner, let's say, sleeping area? That it's not only to be um, ex explained or mainly with a focus on, um, on symbolic. Um, yeah, I so to answer that yeah. quickly, um, I think that's right. I wouldn't, you know, I'm sure that those practical elements are a, a major part of it. It's just that they're also emphasised by the symbolic dimension. So I don't think you can necessarily separate the two in that way, and they're probably inter intertwined, as it were. You know, how we feel about you know, the accumulation of organic materials as dirt or, or whatever is as important a part in the psychology of the housewife or whatever it might be, you know, the house guy in Bunjukli maybe, who, who knows, um, as um, the, the, the practical. So I think they're, they're intertwined and I wouldn't um, want to, um, you know, de-emphasise one as against the other. So that answers that question at least. I, obviously, Ian can talk about ch chattelhoyuk fish, I guess, if he wants to answer that. But uh, I just, uh, I just say in one sentence that um, there's a lot of fish right at the bottom layers of chattelhoyuk, and then there's a very marked drop off very quickly. And why is that? There's no um, assumption. Why, why is that? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't answer that in a stupid way. Mm -hmm. But, but, it, but the, 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 one idea is that there is a gradual drying out and also an overfishing. Good practical answer. I, I think, Colin. Uh, two fascinating papers. It was such breakneck speed, I, I may have got a lot of it wrong. But on, on Gobekli, such an extraordinary site, I understand your desire to downplay the temple site. But nevertheless, you know, you have these monumental people were coming together. I mean, they had to cut, they had to shift. You know, what was going on? Why were they? Was it seasonal? They were coming together. Got some you questions in one. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I'm yeah. Um, uh, where do you start? I mean, the thing we have to realise: these buildings were very long lived. We're looking at perhaps several hundred years per building, if you think about all the phases involved. And we're according to the radiocarbon data. I mean, the radiocarbon samples were taken. These aren't from the fill of the buildings as was taken previously by Clark Schmidt. These, these samples were taken from the um, inclusions in the mud mortar from, in, from the walls. So this is as close as we can get to the, I mean, obviously we can't exclude there was some infiltration of, of you know, other older material, that's always possible. But from the data we have, it really looks quite, and it does tally very well with the, with the uh, um, building archaeology. So they were long-lived, they were recycling lots, and I think a lot of it would have been piecemeal. I think possibly would have larger events or larger building events taking place, and there was a, a general concept to these, these building projects, but the question is how many people were really necessary for this if it was built on a small sort of piecemeal scale? Um, were these people coming from outside to the site, 
pilgrims, as it were, as we'd like to believe if we, you know, as we believe if we, if we followed the religious sort of uh, connotations, or were they being built by people living at the site? As for the uh, people at the site, um, at least in the PPNA, we're not quite sure whether they were permanently there the whole time, all year round. That's something we'll have to find out from the new results, um, for example, from the fallen evidence, etc., from the PPNA uh, deposits we have in these deep soundings. PPNB, I think we're looking at more permanent settlement at the site. I really do think we're looking at a more substantial thing. This is something that we don't see anywhere else. I mean, if you look at the PPNB in southeastern Turkey or in, in the Shanghai Water region at least, this is not comparable to what we're seeing, say, at, at Nevali Chori or at Chayanu. This is something quite different. It's an agglomerative, and if these buildings are, these rectangular buildings are contemporaneous at the, at the same time, this was a substantial settlement comparable to what we're seeing later then in, in the Konya Plain. Or oh, in, in Cappadocia. So I, I think we've got some of those questions. Yes, yeah, uh, absolutely. Huge subject. Mm. I've seen another question here, but I can't remember. Well, did somebody raise a hand? Yes. I, di I didn't, but I, I um, following no. on, following, you must have read my mind, following on from that, I still don't understand, Betty Cappy, why, even with the time span and it being a domestic settlement, of why take the trouble to build bigger and decorate in that extraordinary way? Can you give a reason? Can I give a reason? I might be able to give a reason, but I, I don't know. It's all, you know, hypothetical. I mean, um, of course, we don't actually know whether these early phases of the buildings had these monumental tea pillars. We, what we're seeing, we, we do see in later phases, we see gaps where pillars, pillars have been pulled, um, which probably were monumental stone pillars. Um, but we can't exclude the previous that there were wooden sort of pre, pregenitors that were in, pre, uh, in wood. Um, but why they were doing it? Now, that's a question that we perhaps have to look in a larger context uh, and seeing the Shanwafa region in the context of the early Neolithic in the whole of Southie or in the upper Mesopotamian area. Um, for example, if we look further to the east in the Tigris region, um, we see it around sort of uh, the end of the PPNA uh, a decrease in settlement activity. In fact, a lot of the settlements in the Tigris Basin actually break off at the end of the PPNA. And I think a lot of these final phases where you have these monumental pillars coincides with this break in settlement in the Tigris region and also further um, south in northern Syria. Now, I'm wondering, and this is just pure hypothesis, you know, pure sort of you know, my, my ideas coming out here, but. Um, Possibly what we're seeing is a, a sort of very conservative group. Gebekli Tepe wasn't this sort of advanced sort of looking for innovation, but they were in a way conservative. They were still hunting and gathering. They were there until the late ninth or mid to late ninth millennium to have no domesticated animals, no domesticated crops, as so far discovered. Why? And it seems that they're pushing this sort of conservative, we are the last hunters and gatherers, and this is our tradition. <coughs> That's how I'm seeing this a little bit. So it sounds a bit confused at the moment. It's something I'm working on in my own head, but I think um, that could be one reason why this, <coughs> uh, this tea pillar tradition takes off as, as a way of... of, of, of but I, don't know, I need to think more about it. Sorry to be suspicious, but uh, for one minute, I thought, if you say, no, this is not the temple, nothing, the, the number of tourists might go down. I, I don't <laughs> worry about this. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, outie. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No, um... I, yes. They won't listen to you, you're excavating. <laughs> Good. Um, right, I, I think it's it's time to break now for, for lunch. We've got an, an hour left for refreshments, and um, we can leave at 2 o'clock, but thank um, Ian as well, and our two speakers.